Hey guys, one of the most powerful words, lines I've ever heard is Les Brown when he delivered in a speech at the Georgia Dome. You are the one. You are the one that's going to make your true happiness, fulfillment, peace, success, whatever form you want, happen. It's all up to you. And we have to look at ourselves as being the one. Because ultimately, as Stephen Covey said, we are all just a one. But we are one that's unique, that's individual. So we got to change the paradigm, the thoughts, the, we, the way we look at ourselves. We're not mediocre. There's nothing mediocre about you. We're not like everyone else. You have to start changing that thinking process in your mind if you're going to truly be happy and fulfilled in your life. You have to realize you're the one. You're the one that's going to make it happen. It's all up to you. It's not going to happen without you. Have a great day, everyone. Hey guys. your brain that something is really important whether it's something you don't want or something you do it will actually pay attention to you your brain does not want you to hit your dreams the average person that has not been trained feels fear and puts the brake on and goes and retreats into what they're comfortable doing Rise and shine, it's espresso time. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I am not a morning person, I'm not. But when you start your day off with a powerful routine that inspires you, like watch one of these videos, it will change your life. So let's start your day off right together. Grab your coffee, know that I believe in you, and get ready for a shot of espresso from John Asraf. <laughs> I wake up every morning. Espresso, keep me going. Every morning when you wake up, you have, let's say, let's say it's 10 attention units. If you're using two or three or four or five or six of them on why What's an you attention can't, unit? What do you mean? an attention unit is your, uh, your ability to stay focused. Uh -huh. And your ability to stay focused um, is happening at the conscious and non-conscious level. So if you're processing stuff in the back of your mind of something you're angry at, something you're mad at, something that's stressing you out, that you, or you mm -hmm. don't have enough money, or you don't have the right relationships or the contacts, or whatever. If you're stressing out about that stuff and that's eating up your attention units, that's like having your computer, okay, using up most of its energy in what's behind that you're not using. Yeah. And we all have a certain amount of attention units every day. And so one of the things that uh, you asked me before that I can come back to on the rituals mm -hmm. um, is, is using the attention units in a way that is highly, highly productive versus yeah, wasting a lot of time. And so my ritual, uh, we started earlier, I just remembered that, um, is sure. you know, wake up, meditation, exercise, uh, plant-based protein smoothie, mm -hmm. followed by reviewing my goals. Every day you review every, your goals. Every, every day, five minutes. The goals for the day, the month, the every year. year. Everything. Yeah. I review my overarching goals. Wow. I could do that fairly quickly because mm -hmm. that's my longer range goals. I can review the emotions that I want because mm -hmm. I'm committed to having those emotions every day and feeling a certain way every day. And then I take a look at from, you know, you know five years out, three years, one year, mm -hmm. 90 days, 60 days to today. Wow. 
And so I just review it. And what happened? Piece of paper, the iPad, laminated, and on laminated. my computer. Really? Yeah. yeah. And I have it in a in a in a booklet also. Really? So when I travel, it's really easy. Do you have it with you? I, no, no. It's 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 a uh, it's a pretty oh, big. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. It's like a little manual. You have to send me a photo. So yeah. I can see it. Yeah, I'll send yeah. you. It's called my exceptional life blueprint. I like it. And um, and so the the question many people may ask is why, why would you do that? Well, because you're having thirty five to fifty thousand thoughts a day, right? And your brain isn't certain like what's really important and what's not. Yeah. But if you instruct your brain that something is really important, whether it's something you don't want or something you do, it will actually pay attention to you. Right. So by priming my brain early every day, here is what I want you to focus on. Here are the emotions I want you to express through me. Here's the behaviors that I need to take. Then I am on a daily basis setting the course for what I want my mm. brain to focus on. Mm. I'm cognitively priming the pump. Mm. And if I do it one day, that's great. If I do it 60 days, 100 days, my brain goes, hey, I'm just going to make this freaking automatic because I want to conserve energy. Right. Right? I'm just going to make it automatic. So not only will you focus on it consciously, but I'm just going to make everything happen behind the scenes to help, help you see, think, and feel things that are congruent with what you're trading your life for and sure, what you want to achieve. Sure. So I'm just using the system better. Your brain does not want you to hit your dreams. Your brain is designed to keep you small, to keep you safe, to keep you protected. Your heart wants to create amazing things. Your heart has big dreams. Your heart sees a beautiful world and says, I want to go make something better. And then you wake up the next day and your brain takes over and says, you can't do that. That's too risky. That's too dangerous. Stay small, stay safe. You didn't go to school for that. And what ends up happening is this constant back and forth between your heart and your brain. When you get in these motivated moments when you want to do amazing things and then your brain takes over again and keeps you small. And this is the path that so many entrepreneurs go on. This roller coaster ride of up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. Sound familiar? It's time to get off the roller coaster and start making progress on your dreams. Today's video, I'm going to show you how. So, Yesterday, I got asked on my live stream, Evan, what's the most important part of your daily routine? And so many people have so many different daily routines and, and it's easy to do the things like drink a glass of water in the morning, go outside and get some sunlight and you know all of these things. But the most important thing for me is actually having my intention for the day. I've actually been experimenting with writing it out the day before. So this is, this is what I wrote last night of basically my entire schedule. And then more than just what I'm gonna do, more than just what I'm going to do, it's how I want to feel. What's my intention going into it? So if I look at this, I'm supposed to be recording Espresso videos right now, right? That was on my list. 10.30 a.m., record Espresso videos. It's right there. And here, get a head start even though you don't want to. Recording videos at the beginning is always difficult for me. There's a couple of reasons why. I'm, I'm shy, I'm introverted, I don't crave the spotlight, I don't like being in front of the camera, I don't, I don't, I don't do it for ego purposes. And also I'm afraid. I'm afraid because I want it to be great. I want this video to be the next best video. I, I don't want to disappoint people. My number one fear is going to be that I, I'll disappoint somebody. And so every time you make something, you risk disappointing somebody where it's easier just to stay small, stay safe, don't make anything today. And so it's on my list, the to do, right? I think a lot of you, if you're watching this video, you probably have a list of to do's. But how many of you are actually doing the things on your list of to-dos? <laughs> the hardest part off is just getting started. Already, as I started recording this video, it's a lot easier to keep going and recording more videos. <laughs> this is the first one that I'm recording today. And so having that written down, get a head start, even though you don't want to, reminds me of who I want to be. And what I find so valuable about this is I write this the night before. So the night before, you know, it's, it's 11 o'clock at night. I usually sit on the floor and I review my calendar for the next day and I write out what I'm gonna be doing. And I've added, how do I wanna feel? What's my reminder to myself before stepping into that task? Imagine you're being your own high performance coach, sitting there telling yourself how you wanna feel, remember your intention before starting that next task. And I knew, okay, Evan, this is what you always do. Before you make a video, there's a little bit of procrastination, there's a little bit of fear, there's a little bit of slowness. There's a little bit of, not laziness, but there's a little bit of just apprehension before you get started. Why? Because you don't want to start, because you're afraid, because you don't want to, you don't want to disappoint people. So I write down that message again. Get a head start, even though you don't want to. 
because I got a lot of stuff to do today. I got a lot of videos I need to record today. And if it takes me an hour of procrastination before I film, that's a lot of time wasted. I could be doing other things to help grow my business and push my movement forward. So this, this really helps. And so when somebody asks me, what's the most important part of my morning routine? It's remembering the intention. How do I want today to go? Not just having a list of to do's, but actually writing down how you want to feel and that message to yourself to give you the extra push that you need to move it forward. So how do you do it? I'm going to give you three different suggestions that I think will help you shortcut that talk in your brain and get you into action mode. The first thing is idea to action. So right away, as soon as you get an idea for something, just take action on it. We spend so much time in our heads overthinking, over planning, over analyzing, over researching, over preparing, and then nothing happens. Nothing gets created. Has that, has that ever happened to you? You got this idea that you think is genius and then you spend all this time over planning, over preparing, overthinking, and then you never actually make anything. And then maybe a year or two goes by and you see someone else get rich off of your idea. I'm still a recovering perfectionist myself, right? I lost a $40 million deal when I was 20 something because I was just trying to be too perfect. And so teach yourself to shortcut the brain out. You got an idea, you're going to do something about it. If the intention is positive, if, if the, if the goal is to try to serve and to help other people, idea, action, idea, action, idea, action, do it. The second thing is come up with your intentions. Whether you want to do my method in the night before, write down your calendar and how you want to feel, or if it's just the first thing in the morning, you're, you're looking at your calendar. That's what I used to do before writing it down. I just pull up my phone, load my calendar and just see what was on my list for today. Cause I'd often forget, what am I doing today? I don't know. I just woke up. I'm tired. I look at my calendar and then with each one, I would just mentally go through instead of writing it. How do I want to show up for this person? If I'm making YouTube videos, how do I want to show up? on camera? How do I want to show up for my audience? How do I want to show up for you? I would just mentally think about that as I go through the day. And I basically wake up, go to the bathroom, pull up my phone and start going through my calendar. <laughs> That's it. And how I want to feel that the intention going through each individual item on my calendar. What I love about this is I find that I'm a little more courageous at night compared to in the morning. I just had a, a day, hopefully it was a good day. Hopefully I served, I helped. Um, it's often after I answer some questions on Instagram. So I'm, I'm in the service heart and, and mindset. And I think about how do I want to show up tomorrow? If you find that you have more energy at night or more clarity or more boldness at night, then, then do that. Think about how do you want to show up tomorrow? What are your tasks? Write them down. And with, with each one, just write down what the intention is. How do you want to show up as a human? for each one. So not just a list of to do's, but how you want to feel going into each one. Look, even as an example, every day at 2.30, I spend time with Nina. Okay. Every day at 2.30, take a break from whatever I'm doing, spend time with Nina. We usually go outside for the, a walk with the dogs. Uh, if it's raining, we'll stay inside and do something together. Just a quick break in the middle of the day to spend time together. And that's in my calendar. And on my calendar, it says 2.30, half an hour break with Nina but I wrote down what's my intention, right? So not just time with Nina, I wrote down, have fun and make her feel loved. And I wrote something else down yesterday, but that's my, that's my intention for today. Have fun and make her feel loved. So last night I wrote that down. I'm looking at Nina, she's lying in bed. She's you know about to fall asleep. And I wanna think, how do I wanna show up for her tomorrow for our break? Have fun and make her feel loved. So I look at that again this morning. And I look at it again right now. And then here's what's gonna happen at 2.30. 2 2.30, I'm gonna be done filming my videos. I'm gonna look at my calendar, I look at my sheet here. Let's say 2.30, time with Nina. Have fun, make her feel loved. Just that reminder will make me show up differently. If your goal is to have fun, if your goal is to make somebody feel loved, you're gonna show up slightly differently. I'm gonna show up with more love, with more energy, maybe pulling some kind of joke, maybe picking her up and turning her in a circle, something. I'm going to show up slightly different because I reminded myself that it's not just a break. The intention is to have fun and make her feel loved. And so if you do that for all of the items on your calendar, for every meeting that you've got, for every quiet time that you've got, for every creative moment that you've got, how do you want to show up? If you can write it down, I love the night before and then under each one, how do you want to show up? That prime 
when you look at it, just before you go into the task, will help you show up as you'd like, as your most bold, courageous, proud self. And then step number three is have a routine that challenges you to be a better human. This is why I make these videos. Honestly, the, this Espresso series is supposed to be a morning series that we release five days a week to help you start your day with a shot of Espresso, with, with some love, with some encouragement, with people who are doing more than you. You may never meet me. You may never meet John Astroff. You, you may never meet Bill Gates or Oprah Winfrey or Steve Jobs or the people that I profile on this channel, but you can learn. You can learn from them. I learn from them. I start my day being around them. And the more that you're around these people who are living the life that you want, that have the belief systems that you want, you will start to adopt those as your own as well, because the people around you probably aren't those people, right? How many of the people around you are the people that you look to and say, I want to be like that person. That person's got my life. That person has my ideal values. That person is living the life that I want to live. Probably not, right? And that's okay. You can inspire them to live a better life through your actions but you need to get that push. And so the more you can create that environment around you to help you get it, the greater the chances of you actually going off and accomplishing it. Now I've got some special bonus clips that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. When you just watch a video and get motivated, you have a 35% chance of actually doing something, making a change. That's what the science says. 35%, that's not enough, Believe Nation. But when you watch a video, you get motivated and then you create a specific plan of action for what you're going to do, it jumps to 91% chance of you following through. And when you commit publicly, like put it in the comments below what your plan is, it jumps to 95%. So Believe Nation, your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week, put it down in the comments below so I can celebrate with you. Hey, this is John Asraf, and do you love good books? I love to read because there's so much wisdom in books. You get to take somebody else's knowledge, skills, research, pay 15, 20 bucks, and you learn so much. Now, I'm reading this awesome book called Built to Serve. Find your purpose and become the leader you were born to be. And one of my new friends, really smart guy, really great guy who serves a lot of people, Evan Carmichael, um, wrote it and um, I'm gonna read a little bit from chapter number one. And um, I love this piece. And uh, maybe it's because I just watched uh, the series on TV on Michael Jordan, The Last Dance, which is really great, by the way, also. But one of the things he says here is everybody has Michael Jordan talent at something. Everybody has a Michael Jordan talent at something. You just haven't found it yet. Or you have and you don't believe in yourself enough to go all in to go all in right and you're a genius i believe you're a genius and so does he you're amazing you were not meant to live a photocopy of someone else's life you were not created to wake up and do work that is below your capabilities you have michael jordan level talent at something and you need to uncover exactly what your purpose is and how you can serve and use the serve. So lots of pearls and gems and motivational pieces. Pick up built to serve. Evan Carmichael, right? Oh, my God. 
that same power, that same determination to see in our mind the image, the visions that we want to create today in our lives. Let's see ourselves doing the best we can on all of the stretches and exercises we do together here. that power we have, our true being, our presence, our determination to see in our mind right now, go into the future. Good morning, Determination. How's everyone doing today? Another beautiful day here, outdoors. Uh, if you're indoors, wherever you are, let's go, everybody. Here we go. Another wonderful moment together. Another great day in the gym of life. Gym of life never ends. So here we go. We're going to start, when I say go, we're going to start jogging on the spot, doing the best jog we can, best jog we've ever done, or we can simply walk on the spot. So depending on how much space you have. You should be able to do this within the space that we have. So here we go. Ready, everybody? When I say go, your best jog ever. Ready? And go. Still focused on our breathing. In through your nose. Feeling the 
and joy of you commanding your body. Remember, you're the boss of your mind. Your mind is the boss of your body. Almost there. Let's go, everybody. Keep going. With the power of our heart starting to beat a little bit faster. Our breathing becoming a little bit more difficult. But feel our power still controlling our breathing. And stop. All right, back to our best walk, either side to side or simply walking on the spine. But focused on our breathing. In through your nose and out through your mouth. Oh, wow. What a day. What another pristine perfect day. Enjoy every moment, wherever you are, enjoy this. Enjoy your power, your gift, to always work on your mind and your body. Always in the gym of life. Okay, everybody, let's start with our 10 shoulder rolls forward. Here we go, ready? And go. Stop. Let's do arm circles forward. Big arm circles. Ten forward. All right. Now let's go backwards. Again, just feel the joy of you controlling your body to move through space, all through the power and control of your own determination. for the sky wherever you are. Here we go. Holding it for 10 seconds. And now reach for your toes, straight knees. Again, feel the joy and the striving. Reaching for your toes, even if you can't touch them yet. Always yet. You get to work all the time. back up. Okay, let's uh, work on our balance. Grab one leg and find your balance. Bend the other knee if you have to. Hold it for 10. Pull that leg back. Feel the power of you finding your balance in this moment. And switch to the leg. And bend that knee. Then you've got roots going under your feet, going through the ground. Hug our knee this time. Bend the other knee if you have to. Big hug. And find that balance again. Hold it for 10 seconds. Lose your balance, you get it right back. Excellent, everyone. Let's do five push-ups together. Here we go. 
That's five push-ups. If you gotta keep your knees down, go ahead. Whatever you do, do your best. Five steps. What a moment. All right, and let's do five squats. Our best five squats. Here we go. Feet flat on the floor, looking straight ahead. Bending the knees all the way down, all the way up. All right, let's do lunges now. Three on each side. Best lunges. Keeping that back straight if we can, looking straight ahead. Excellent. All right, let's do 10 second plank. Belly's knees off the ground. Always thinking about our Bringing ourselves back to our presence. Our for our toes everybody here we go ready straight knees or reaching for your toes do the best we can always working on motivating our minds because we know our bodies will fall and be shape with our legs reaching for the floor as far away from our body as we can holding the thing For one side, hold it there. Yeah, feel the joy. Reach and strive. Do your best. Even if you aren't able to reach where you want to be yet. And switch to the other side. Feel the power of your wings right now. All right, and let's put our feet together. And gently push our knees down with our elbows. There we go. Hold it there for 10. Feel the power of infinite intelligence in you, in me, and all of us right now. Okay, one leg forward, one leg back. Go as far back as you can. Keep that knee on the ground. Okay, and switch to the other side. Alright, and let's roll onto our belly and push the ground or the floor and look up at the ceiling or the sky, wherever we are. Here we go, cobra stretch. Hold it there for 10. again, back straight, eyes closed, breathing in through our noses and out through our mouths. Here we go. Going into the future, into our imagination right now. Seeing what we want to do our best on today when that music goes on. For me, I'm going to be working on two exercises. One, lunges, as many lunges as I can do within the first song, and the second song, as many sit-ups as I can do until that song is over. So what about you? See it in your mind right now. You can play two of your own songs, you can listen to the songs I have, but choose your own exercises if you don't like the ones I'm doing, it doesn't matter, whatever you're doing, whatever you want to do, whatever movement you want to do safely and effectively, see it in your mind right now before you bring it out into the world. You've got determination. You were born to win. To bring out all your visions, all your positive visions of yourself, of people, of the world. 
way we do our best on these exercises when that music goes on. It's an expression, a reflection of the way we do our best at Proud of you. If you haven't given up, keep going. Alright, sit up for me. Here we go. Always control your breathing. Bring it back in. The fact that you can still control your breathing, even when your body wants to breathe faster, that's more proof of your determination. You got it in you all the time, no matter what. You 
can apply this. You can use this energy. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are. The way you talk. The way you behave. The way you read, write. The way you're kind and loving. Use determination. Use your power to be positive and never give up. Just like we're doing right now. On these exercises, on these steps, we're not giving up. No matter how hard it's getting. See, we know the truth. If we do what is easy, we give up. Our life will be hard. But if we do what is hard and never give up, our life will be easy. So we gotta remember that all the time. That's the power of our determination. Controlling our mind. Motivating the mind. So the body will fall. Keep going, determination. I'm so proud of you, wherever you are. Because you are who you are. Strive to be better all the time. You are infinite and selfless. You, we, are double up. Infinitely intelligent, powerful beyond measure. We don't choose to lose, we determine and win. Still with me? Keep going. I love you. I'm so proud of you. Keep going. Even if you stop. Get back up at it again. Keep going. This is the way you're gonna live. Even if you stop, even if you get tired, even if you make mistakes, you're gonna learn. You're gonna get information. And you're gonna eventually win. That's how powerful you are. That's why I love you and all. Okay, that's good. Love it. Keep going. Our body will rest and recover. Almost there. Keep going, everybody. Keep going. Oh, I'm all done. So proud of you.
to control our minds, to control our breathing, to control our bodies, to control our lives. It's all possible through the power of you being present, staying in the now, right here, right now, wherever you are, wherever you are. There is no past the future right now. I love your determination. Great work today. I'm so proud of you, wherever you are. Take the power of this time we had together, apply it to everything in your life. Doesn't matter whether we're in school, at work, wherever we are. The gym of life never ends. And life is the greatest teacher. That's why I love you and everything and all the infinite intelligence around us. It's life. It's always here. You're always learning, always growing. I love your determination. Have a great day, week, and life always. Until next time. Welcome to the Billionaire Mindset, your 30-day journey to thinking like a billionaire. Now you can just watch this video or if you wanna sign up for the entire series for free and get the bonus PDF companion calendar, check the link in the description below. Today is bonus day four and we're gonna learn from the fourth richest person on the planet at the time of this recording with a net worth of $126.8 billion, Mr. Bill Gates. I think you know you can over worship and mythologize the idea of working extremely hard. For my particular makeup, I mean, it really is true that I didn't believe in weekends. I didn't believe in vacations. I mean, you know, I knew everybody's license plate, so I could tell you over the last month when their car had come and gone from the, the parking <laughs> lot. It, it, so. I don't recommend it. A, I don't think most people would enjoy it. Uh, once I got into my 30s, I could hardly even imagine how I had done that. Uh, because by then, some natural behavior kicked in and I loved weekends and uh, you know, my girlfriend liked vacations and that turned out to be kind of a neat thing. Uh, <laughs> now I take lots of vacations. I mean, my 20-year-old self is so disgusted with my uh, current uh, uh, self, you know. I, I was sure I would never do anything but ride and coach. You know, now I have a plane. So it's, it's <laughs> very much counter-revelations have taken place at, at high speed. But yes, it is nice if during those first several years, if you have a team that's chosen to be pretty maniacal about the company and how far that goes, you, you know, should have a mutual understanding so you're not uh, one person expecting one thing, another person expecting another thing. And you'll have individuals who, who have, you know, health or relatives or things that are distracted. But yes, I have a fairly hardcore view that there should be a very large uh, sacrifice made during those, those early years.
Today, people come to you all the time for money, I assume. Everywhere you go, people say, by the way, I have this thing you should invest in. I have a couple myself I'll mention later. No, I'm not just kidding. No, a couple of things you should invest in or things you should give money to. So how do you resist it? You have some person who says no for you, or how do you do that? Let many people. Uh, many people say no. Well, once you pick what you care about, if somebody has something that can make a difference in global health, we're super interested. And you know, we have staff of 1,500 people, and if it's to do with global health, some of those people will come out and talk through with you whatever your innovation is and how we can partner with you on that. Okay. You know, so that's clearly in our area. If it is something that can substantially improve K through 12 education, then we're going to be very interested in it. If people are asking outside of those things, then you know, fortunately, you can say no because focus is, is key to philanthropy. The digital revolution, internet, social media, all of that, in certain respects, it's made it easier for us to see what's going on. Medical researchers are publishing articles every day, and all over the world, people can immediately see what the new thinking is there. Tracking the disease statistics, I click on the John Hopkins website every morning and see, okay, which countries are having a tough time with cases or, or deaths. Thank God for the internet. Work at home, you know, our ability to connect up with each other is driven by that. But it also has meant that a lot of very surprisingly interesting conspiracy theories that are false. Sadly, they spread a lot faster than the truth. You know, so the idea that did somebody intentionally cause this thing, completely false, even in some cases accusing me of having some connection, that can be dangerous because it means, you know, your willingness to believe is the vaccine something I should take? Should I wear masks? You know, if you go for these simple but wrong theories, getting people to work together and protect each other so we can get out of this as soon as possible, that's really at risk. You raise the question of how should the government deal with that? It's very difficult. Ideally, citizens are just well-informed and they know which publications are very careful about what they say and we don't have to engage in censorship. But so much of the almost crazy false information is out there that looking at the companies like Facebook and saying, okay, what is their role in that? You know, when somebody says masks don't work, which is wrong, or they say just take hydroxychloroquine and you'll be totally safe. What is their responsibility for catching those things, particularly when they get out to large numbers? That is being debated. And, you know, I think we'll come out of this with those companies feeling a stronger sense of responsibility and actually understanding having the public debate about uh, how they need to help here. You really have to believe the internet's going to be mainstream. A lot of people are going to get out there and use it and that they're going to be willing to pay for some content. Is that the operating idea that you have? Well, each of these businesses uh, is an entrepreneurial business. Uh, the overreaching theme is that, yes, I believe in the internet. I believe it'll get increasingly popular, and we're doing some neat new things to take advantage of that. Is part, you've got a lot of cash on hand, yes? Right. All right. <laughs> it puts you in an enviable position. You can experiment with a lot of entrepreneurial ideas and see what sticks and what flies. Well, we're, we're in business to make money. And but the other thing is providing such a cash flow for you. Well, it, it all belongs to the shareholders. Yeah. Uh, we're not dilettantes. <laughs> no, I know. We, we are business people. <laughs> and it is true that if you find an idea that requires three or four years of improvement and patience and really sticking with it, uh, that we're very good at that. Take Windows, which we bet our company on. Everybody doubted that would succeed. IBM did not support us in that. Uh, it took longer than we expected, uh, over four years before finally graphical interface got popular. And now people take it for granted. It's part of every personal computer and you just you just expect it to be there. That was one of the grand successes of the company. In the same way we're betting on the internet, that our tools there will be popular, and that a few of these content plays that we've decided to get involved in, that the scale and, and the users will make those into great businesses. We also are big believers in, in United Way and, and what goes on there, and that's more at a business level. We sort of think every business ought to do that as a basic thing, because social services uh, we think have a, a per, deserve particular priority in terms of drawing employees in to to help 
help the community. And there's ways to take those fundraising things within a company and have contests and comparisons and great stories, get the word out, make it fun, make it easy. You know, it's just a piece of email. The easiest thing to do is click and say you want to give your fair share, and then we send you no more email. Uh, so <laughs> we've made it the easiest thing to do is, is, uh, is participate. In terms of individuals, it's quite different. You know, you can take and give to groups like United Way who are really thinking about everything in the community, or you can find things, and most people mix this, you can find things that you're particularly interested in, that you know about, that a relative benefited from, or that you want to go and volunteer in. Uh, you know, Microsoft does a thing now, for every hour that somebody volunteers, we actually uh, make a grant to that organization, because that says that they're, they care about it, and uh, they think it's, it's doing very good work. Now, for individuals, at some levels, probably most of your giving is going to be in the community where you know what's going on. I'm a big believer that, that the, some of the greatest inequities are on a global basis. And so uh, one of the things our foundation tries to get out is the names of a number of organizations like Save the Children or Global Fund or Vaccine Fund that we know are taking dollars in a very efficient way and saving lives and improving conditions. And you know, I would hope that as people are able to be fairly generous, that this international component, that it be part of, of what they're doing. Obviously, if you get up to enough scale, then you can uh, take on big projects. And I will get a chance with some of my extra time to go out and, and share with people who are uh, lucky enough to have wealth, um, just tell them how much fun I'm having and that it can have impact and you know, hopefully encourage it. I, I think when Warren Buffett gave, gave his gift, it sent a message to people that, wow, uh, you know, we got, we, we, this is the, the right thing to do, and you know, he, he doesn't like to waste money. Uh, so you know, a sense that there are causes out there that you can make a big difference with. There's no doubt that uh, you know, creating a board, having people like Dave Marquardt there who wasn't at the company, you know, and we were so overwrought about, you know, this is right, this is wrong, we messed this up, that having people have a little bit of distance uh, come in and talk to us is good. You know, for the last, uh, oh, 30 years or so, I've gotten to be friends with Warren Buffett. And he, he's in Omaha, uh, he's not in this tech world at all. You know, and to <laughs> him it's like, hey, how could you ever know which will rise and which will fall. I'm not going to put money uh, <laughs> until Apple sold at a multiple of 12. Then uh, <laughs> he decided he could put 50 billion into that. Uh, <laughs> after he asked all his friends, hey, you know, if, they, if somebody had an uh, iPhone that was half as expensive, would you switch away? You know, or is it more like jewelry, where you really want uh, to, to have an iPhone? And so he decided that the, those profit streams might not be eliminated anytime soon. Anyway, he, because he's not in this world, he has a, a, a definite way of looking at things, including this idea of how uh, work should be fun. He has made his work so much fun that he works more hours than I do. He works six days a week at 88 years old. And he likes to say that he skips to work every day. He, he doesn't, but uh, he says that. <laughs> it's a uh, visual. He, when he was 83, he could still skip, but now he's gotten <laughs> really, he can't do it. Uh, so uh, having somebody like that, you know, the toughest thing I went through was this antitrust lawsuit yeah. where, you know, it didn't seem uh, very predictable. Uh, and he was a great counsel during all of that stuff. So getting somebody who's in, successful in another domain, uh, uh, but yet kind of a business uh, type mindset. Anyway, for me, that, that was a huge gift. I think it's important that we build that feedback system. Now, exactly how you do that, how much you connect that up to the pay system, uh, you know, we need experimentation, and we can look at these other countries that have done it. There is a move afoot to do some of this, but whether the investment levels be enough to make it high quality, and whether the, um, there'll be kind of high stakes that overuse the test scores uh, for this stuff and, and will sort of hurt its reputation, it's hard to say at this point, but I'd say it's 
Uh, giving more feedback to teachers would be the very first thing uh, that would get us back up to, the, uh, to being one of the best in the world. In 2021, you no longer need to have tens of thousands of dollars to build an app idea. Did you? If you want to have impact, uh, usually delegation is important. Uh, although, you know, individual contributors in terms of inventing a drug or a new approach to things, that's phenomenal. So when Microsoft first got started, I wrote most of the code and everybody else's code I read and kind of rewrote. Uh, and <laughs> that got us up to 10 people. And then I had to say to myself, okay, we're gonna ship code that I didn't edit. Uh, and that was hard for me, uh, but I, you know, I kind of got over that. Then I still said, okay, I'm gonna interview everyone and I'm gonna at least look at samples of their code. Well, that got us up to about 40 people. And that was at a point where I had sold way more software than we could write uh, because everybody was so impressed. And I thought, well, I need to keep enough, collect enough money to you know, keep hiring all these people. But uh, the demand was so high that you know, we were actually falling behind. That's when I hired Steve. And Steve figured out, A, uh, how to control what promises I made to people. Uh, and B, how to hire lots of people and good, really good people and create organizations and teams. So I delegated to Steve that. He was constantly saying to me, okay, we're gonna hire programmers that you've never met. And I'd say, no, we're not. And then he, he would show me numerically that the constraint wasn't gonna work. Uh, you know, so uh, then I said, okay, then I would you know, know all the managers of the people. And so over time, uh, and of course, you know, I could say the quality per person was falling monotonically, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, according to me. Uh, but you know, large problems. Uh, if you want to, you know, write the most popular uh, office productivity software, that one person absolutely can't do that. You can write pretty code. So everyone has to decide what scale of organization they want to work in. Eventually. You know, my role was very much as a leader and a reviewer of managers, but the top people, and I hired some super experienced people, uh, I would make sure they were pursuing a common vision and they were well coordinated. But in terms of a lot of management stuff, they were way better than I was. Now I had to have the framework to know what mix of skills that we needed and you know when they were working well enough together. But a lot of, uh, you know, my, value add of was picking, say, to do graphics user interface or to do an integrated office uh, type thing or to go global and not use agents to have Microsoft be present all over the world. And so, yeah, picking what you're good at and how you find the other people uh, to fill in those things, that's super important. And most founders don't, aren't able to scale that up and kind of give up the hands-on things that they used to get a lot of uh, pleasure and comfort from urgency that I felt that if we didn't get Microsoft going right away that somebody uh, would do a great job building a software company, we won't have a chance. That probably ended up not being true, that I could have waited two or three years and the opportunity to do Microsoft still would be there. But anyway, I felt a sense of urgency. Uh, and you know, it's not like you know, I still get to take courses and learn things. Um, today, you know, things like the learning company and there's all sorts of right. great books. So it's not like I've missed some part of my education. Right. When you dropped out, your father and mother said, are you sure you know what you want to do? If one of your children dropped out of college to start a company, what would you say? Well, I'd have to say yes, but uh, <laughs> the dropping out is not an irrevocable decision. Uh, you know, if you try and start a company that doesn't go well, they always let you go back. Uh, and so if you don't have, you know, kids that you need to uh, support, you know, it's a very low risk thing, particularly in the culture of the United States where trying to start something and, and failing is not a black mark for the rest of your life. So when you were starting Microsoft, there were a lot of other software companies and you were not the number one at the beginning. I think there were others who were a little bit further ahead. What was it that enabled you to beat everybody else up in the software business? Was it? Bill Gates, was it something else? What was the unique factor that made you the most successful? Yeah, we were actually the first. And, but there were companies, uh, and they were all kind of single product companies, 
who got ahead of us uh, in terms of sales, um, you know, by uh, about 1991, uh, we, we did become the largest uh, of all of them. We were an engineering company. We were about how you hire smart people and how you use tools to develop software broadly. We were global and we weren't about a single product. So like, for example, WordPerfect was a word processor, somebody might remember. Uh, they did so well with that product that their gross sales rivaled ours when we were doing a broad set of products. As soon as graphics interface caught on, which was Windows uh, that became mainstream in 1995, we became far larger than the other software companies. Now, subsequently, uh, you know, Google, Apple, uh, Amazon have become, uh, you know, also extremely right. successful. But in the 90s, we were the strongest uh, okay. by far. There's no doubt that the antitrust lawsuit was bad for Microsoft, and it, it, we would have been more focused on creating the uh, phone operating system. And so instead of using Android today, you would be using Windows Mobile. If it hadn't been for the antitrust case, uh, Microsoft would have gone, oh, we were so close. We, we, you know, I was just too distracted. I screwed that up uh, because of the distraction. And you know, we were just three months too late with the release that Motorola would have used on a phone. Uh, so yes, uh, it's a winner take all game, that right. is for sure. That, you know, now nobody here has ever heard of Windows Mobile. Uh, but oh well. And I wouldn't, uh, well, that's a few hundred billion here or there. Uh, I wouldn't have retired as soon. And that one is less, you know, I am disappointed that Windows Mobile didn't succeed. But in terms of uh, my own life, you know, even though it was a very painful thing because I got very personally involved in the defense of the company. The fact that I retired earlier, probably net was good for me because I got down the learning curve on the foundation. I got to right. partner with Melinda in the early days of the foundation. And you know, I don't have a life where I'm allowed to complain uh, because basically you know, only 99% of things have worked out very, very well. The idea that you could get people to, to decide to support this foreign aid thing, which is a big deal uh, for our foundation, from a numeric point of view, we're still pushing that a little bit, but honestly, the story of the one child, you know, if you say to an audience, here's the picture of this child, shall we save this child? They're more engaged than if you said, hey, let's save a million children. You know, so there's definitely a sort of, you know, 10 to the sixth problem uh, here somewhere. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> that fascinating. Humans are not wired uh, to be, to, do that on a numeric basis. Um, and so, you know, that's why we have people like Bono and, and many others who come from a more storytelling world, yeah. and then they let me throw a few charts and numbers in just uh, <laughs> because I think uh, that that should, should be there. Once your heart tells you what direction to go in to prove that this is a, a very affordable, not, you know, not a big deal, well-managed path to, to be on. If you were uh, 20 years old today and you wanted to start a new company, drop out of Harvard, what company or what area would you want to start it in? Well, this is a, a great time to be doing innovation because the tools of innovation are so much better. There are lots of things in biology that are very interesting. Uh, there are lots of things in energy that are interesting. Given my background, I would start an AI company that uh, whose goal would be to uh, teach computers how to read so that they can absorb and understand all the written knowledge of the world. That's an area where AI has yet to make progress and it will be quite profound when we achieve that goal. Most people over the last 200 years or so, whoever they, the wealthiest person in the world was, didn't usually work that hard when they got to be 60 or so. They kind of took life easy. You seem to be working pretty hard. What motivates you to still work so hard? Well, I love my work. The work of the foundation is super interesting. I get to meet with the scientists. I get to go out in the field. I do think your habits are sort of set in your 20s and 30s. 
And by my standards of the 20s, you know, I didn't believe in weekends back then, uh, not to mention vacations. So I'm you know, fairly lazy compared to myself in my 20s, where I was a true uh, fanatic. Uh, you know, all I believed in was working on software night and day, and, and for my 20s, that was perfect. I didn't have a wife or family uh, at all, and my role was very hand, hands-on role. You know, I, I'm very lucky that my foundation work, the part-time work I do for Microsoft, I see that extending you know, for decades into the future, and having an understanding of innovation, uh, you know, I think shaping innovation in many of these areas, uh, there is a unique role that I can, right. I can help play. I like to look at numbers a lot, and so when I look at the numbers, I'm just amazed, whether it's the quality of the inner city education, the dropout rates. Oprah did a thing where she had kids from an inner city school go look at the suburban school and vice versa. And they were just stunned that the building and everything was so completely different. So I think, you know, even for me, I have to go, you know, whether it's the inner city in America, talking to people who live there, or outside the US, we have this same thing, you know, the situation in Africa, you know, it's overwhelmingly uh, black population is so much worse than people are probably aware of. And so hands on visits, whether it's to the schools or the clinics, I think that is necessary to hear the voices of people who've been hurt. And then, you know, there's a lot of good movies now. There's a lot of good books. I was just reading the new Jim Crow, which is pretty eloquent and forceful about the justice system and the role that it plays in perpetuating bad conditions. And, you know, it takes a lot to try and put yourself having empathy for other people. So we all have to push harder on this. I get to, when I, you know, say, okay, we're gonna build a 